doing that. Um, but the way we've structured the panel is we have some general um, ideas and then some specific exercises that a few of us have done. Um, so we'll walk through those. Hi, I'm Rose Shinko. I'm the Undergraduate Program Director in the School of International Service. And I also have uh, published on the whole idea of thinking, writing, and doing IR theory. I'm a theorist. And my comments today will be about using theory as a framework for student writing. And in particular, I will focus on our new program in SIS, our first year seminar series, and explain how we're working with our first year students in terms of developing their critical thinking, writing, speaking, uh, as well as reading skills. Hi, good morning. I'm Declan Fatty. Uh, I work in the School of Communication. I'm in the Journalism Division there. And I'll be talking about a specific course uh, that's taught to all SOC majors and minors called Writing for Communication. And then why don't we just do a quick round of introductions so we know who's in the room uh, and why you picked this panel. Yeah, Greg Hunnett, um, Justice Law and Society, SPA. Uh, and the reason why I picked this is that's always the major, major issue because most of uh, the uh, students or most of my classes involve a, involve a lot of writing, so <laughs> that's why. Uh, Tony Clayton, I teach uh, in SIS. I do uh, a lot of the writing. I and what my students do is bureaucratic uh, writing, memoranda, this kind of thing, and I spend an enormous amount of time correcting their writing, and we like to know how to reduce my workload and improve their skills. Uh, Sherry Mueller, I teach cultural diplomacy at the School of International Service, and um, like my colleagues, even though I teach at the undergrad level, also practicum, a practicum, last spring, still amazed at how much time I spend coaching um, them on their editing skills and using precise language. Yes. <laughs> so, glad to have this opportunity to hear from you. I'm Jose Garzon, I'm a brand new adjunct at School of National Service. I am Catherine Bosker. I uh, teach at SIS two practicum, one on issues of multinational enterprises, where my students I'm teaching my students to be international business consultants. So they do they divide themselves up into teams and they write research papers with advice for their real life clients like Lockheed Martin and Marriott and so forth. Second practicum I teach is on Hungarian innovation where the students do the same thing. They do research and writing and they give um, advice to the Hungarian Ministry of Economy and Innovation. And uh, the reason I'm here is I have found and I've taught these two practicum for two years now, going into my third year in the spring, the students absolutely cannot write. And the last couple of days before the final, the paper's supposed to go to the client, they send it to me and it's, you know, not so much from the point of view of the strategy and the thinking is off, but the grammar. American graduate students in the final semester of their, of their graduate program do not know grammar and syntax. I don't know if we're going to be able to solve that. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jeremy Dano, a brand new faculty in the Department of Government. I'll be teaching uh, writing kinds of classes like uh, individual authority, um, in individual freedom versus authority. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Carla Slayman, I'm in the Behavior, Cognition, and Neuroscience PhD program here, and I'm a TA, so I get a lot of writing assignments, so working on feedback and how to help improve the writing through that. What am I supposed to say? Who you are and why you're here, Sally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sally Shelton Colby. I teach in uh, SIS, um, a variety of courses, and I am constantly appalled at the poor writing, the miserable punctuation. Um, I just said that grammar, grammar, and syntax, I, grammar and syntax. I, it's just unbelievable, even among my grad students. So I need to learn how to fix this. <laughs> I'm Laura Field and I'm joining the faculty in SIS. I, I guess I haven't experienced this too long here, but I guess you do have some So are you now frightened? So and you're always interested to hear advice about 
I'm Megan Dowdy, uh, School of Public Affairs, uh, PhD program. I'm part of the Greenberg Teaching Center, so you know, heads up. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Ruth Kabor. I'm a first year PhD student in history, and I'm also part of the Greenberg Seminars, and I'm interested in learning Hi, uh, I'm Karen Schaup, and I'm a new full-time faculty member in the college writing program. Um, <laughs> and I'm here today, to, I'm really interested in um, the conversation about writing um, university-wide. So you're going to fix everything? Yeah, yeah. everything. <laughs> everything. <laughs> this Taking semester. care of that. <laughs> yeah. Coming in, uh, my name is Constance Lindsay. I'm a new faculty member in the School of Public Affairs. Yes, so I'll start first. Um, my comments may or may not be really directed to those of you doing graduate work. I was asked to speak uh, specifically about the first year seminars and what we're doing in SIS. And so at <coughs> first I thought I would give you some overview of the intent of the FYS. For SIS, the whole point of the first year seminar is to really develop the competencies of our first year students to enable them to be successful as they work their way through the major in SIS. Their second year, they're looking at a year-long research sequence, 206, which gives them all of the different ways of doing research in IR, followed by 306, where they are paired with a senior faculty member doing some particular type of research, <coughs> doing some particular type of research on an issue, on an event, and we match the students so that they will spend an entire semester carrying out a research project. So for us, the first year seminar is intended to provide them with the critical thinking skills, the critical reading skills, critical speaking skills, as well as writing skills. So what I wanted to do today was to preface and to form my comment around that critical triad. And for us in FYS, it begins with the reading. And it begins with engaging students in how to read. They can't write if they don't read. They can't write critically if they don't read. So in the FYS, we begin with a series of different ways to actually engage a text. So for me, before you assign anything to a student, you need to give them a purpose for reading. You need to explain to them what they are looking for, what you want them to be on the lookout for, what you intend by having them read this piece. In my first year seminar entitled Imagination and Creativity in IR, I introduced them to a whole series of postmodern thinkers in IR. And I start with Hannah Arendt. And my goal was to show them how theorists could take concepts that we use that are traditional concepts in international relations, but how those concepts can be reimagined, reformulated. So with Hannah Arendt's essay, we worked on just one small chapter from Hannah, and we read the chapter on action. And before I assigned the reading, I told them, I actually gave them the essay assignment, and they had it, it's posted on the syllabus, so they know up front, they know what they're reading for, they know what to be on the lookout for. So the idea for them was to read that chapter and to pay attention to the idea of speaking and acting in public, her conceptualization of identity, her conceptualization of action, and her idea of plurality, freedom, and remembrance. So. Before I even assign the reading, I discuss with them how and what they should be looking for in the reading. Then I went through static, I actually went through the reading assignment with them and what to look for. So that I pulled it up on Blackboard, there it was, and I said, let's just preview the chapter. What's the title of the chapter? And then I engage them, what kinds of things does this bring to mind? What are you thinking? What do you think this is going to be about? We look through and I say to them, how long is this? Okay, let's see how many pages it is. Let's talk about how long it's going to take you to read this. Let's look at the introduction. Let's look at the conclusion. I advise them to read the intro and the conclusion first before they do anything in the middle. I ask them to preview the subheadings and to start, and this is a, this is a model used at the secondary level, SQ3R, only I've updated it and made it 
a little bit more challenging for first year college students. So the idea is before they ever read, they already are formulating in their mind questions and relationships with the text. And then I tell them what I need you to do is when you're going through and reading it, you want to block out, you want to put in parentheses, you want to underline, you want to highlight the key terms that we're looking for. Pay attention to the words that keep showing up. Look at the subheadings. What kinds of words are in the subheadings and where are you seeing and finding those terms within the section that you're reading? So for me, writing is really about good reading. It's almost like artists who go to the art gallery and they spend hours copying paintings. For me, it's a similar metaphor. And I use the writing of the theorists as a way to encourage students to learn how to write in that similar vein of writing theory and IR. So the next thing then that we do, we come back, we, they've read, and then I actually have them doing verbal writing in class so that they're speaking the way I'm going to have them write. So the idea is, first of all, I break them into teams. I call them rapid response teams. And I'm going to talk really fast because I have a lot of stuff to shove in here. So the key is, I ask them in their rapid response te teams, go through the reading and identify all the key vocabulary. What are the key concepts? Just go through in your team and get them all down and listed. And then I solicit the responses, we put them up on the board, we identify what are the key ideas, concepts we need to know from this reading that we've just done by Hannah Arendt. Then I ask them, back again in their teams, define them, go through the, go through the chapter and identify all the places where you pick up pieces of what these terms mean. What I'm trying to show them is, the concepts don't have a single definition that you're going to find one place here. Hannah serves it up to you on a platter. You've actually got to read through the text and pull together strains of ideas and concepts so that you can make some type of a under, they're going to get to other exercises out of this, but what I'm trying to get them to do is pull all the pieces together so that they can see how and where she, and why she mentions action. Then I will have them stop and say, okay, let's just create a modified version of a concept map. Put the key concept in the middle, and then I just want you to make spokes and write circles around all of the other ideas that link to this main idea. So again, they're working in teams. Each time I give a small exercise, I stop, and then I solicit responses. I put it up on the board so that they're constantly checking how they're doing and what they're learning and making sure that they're getting the key ideas and the key terms. So then after we do that, I say to them, okay, now what I want you to do is I want you to create a summary sentence in your own words, identifying what Hannah Arendt means by the term of speaking and acting in public. What does this concept of action entail? So then they work in their teams, they write a sentence, we solicit the sentences from them, and here's the point at which you can talk about grammar, what terms they're using, how they're saying it, how they're putting the sentence together. So they're writing and hearing. They're not using laptops, they're actually using pens and paper here. And so they're writing out these summary sentences, and then we talk about those. Then we talk about how they would create a descriptive thesis statement once we've gone through and looked at all the concepts, then I ask them, how would you create a thesis statement that is descriptive, pulling together this theme, this idea of action for Hannah Arendt? How would you create a thesis statement? And then bullet point, what do you think would be <coughs> the most important things to cover if you were going to define and describe this thesis statement, defend it, and be able to explain it? So then we do that. I must also stop and say this is a two and a half hour class. This is taught in a seminar block, all right? But you can easily break these into two segments and I do it when I teach world politics the same way. So that's the reading part. That's the critical engagement part in class. So that's just kind of an overview of what we do. Then the next thing I do, the second part of this, for me, any writing assignment comes in three parts 
probably because I'm Catholic and I'm all hung up on the Trinity. <laughs> but at any rate, so I always have the critical reading, the writing, the verbal writing in class, the discussion skills. Sometimes I'll even stop and ask students to just stand up and make a presentation. Just off the cuff, talk about Hannah Arendt. What three things would you say about her? Uh, so I try to use a variety of things to keep it interesting. The second part of my writing triad is always some type of practical application. In this case, I happen to be fortunate enough that the Ai Weiwei exhibit was downtown. So we took our second class, and you can see where this is going. We went to see the Ai Weiwei exhibit. In conjunction with the exhibit, they were given an interview with him to watch on PBS. They were also given some documentary materials uh, that were at the Hirshhorn that they had posted on their website. And then they were also given some other material on PBS NewsHour where they had done a special on Ai Weiwei. So they were to watch all of that. And the idea, again, was to tell them, what are you looking for? Well, you're looking for the art and the words, the actions of Ai Weiwei, and what he is doing with his art and why, and his political interventions with his art. So I gave them a context. We go to the gallery, that's a whole class. Then we come back. Here's the essay assignment. The essay is called Constructing the Self-Reflexive Self. And this is the first part for me of learning about our own imagination and creativity in terms of writing and speaking and reading IR theory. So the essay I gave them was the following. Here's the question. And it's it's direct and it's set up this way because my writing assignments cascade. So I start with the first one is the sample of what I want them to do and, and my expectations for their writing from a theoretical perspective. And then the subsequent assignments build on that first assignment. All students have an opportunity to revise and resubmit every assignment I give. That is an open, um, open possibility for every single <coughs> assignment. And then the midterm and final are summary writing projects that synthesize the material from the first half of the class. So for me, teaching is much like a circle. And we keep treading the same ground, but in slightly different iterations. Um, the metaphor for me is learning how to serve a tennis ball. You don't just go out and do it once. You spend hours doing it. You hit thousands of balls. You hit thousands of balls and try to hit different placement on a court. Writing for me is a similar thing. They've got to keep encountering the same type of a project but in different formulations over the course of the semester so that they can keep practicing and learning, practicing and learning. And each one just gets slightly different in its iteration. Each one gets slightly more complex. This one uses two examples, uh, a theorist and then an artist. The next one uses a theorist and then an article they read on the London transport bombings. And they use two chapters from a theorist and they actually use a political event. So I keep reshaping the format, but what I'm asking them to do is basically the same. So they keep practicing thesis drafting, support, detailed documentation. So the essay assignment was, how do Ai Weiwei's acts and words as reflected in his statements and art projects, exemplify Arendt's conceptualizations of action. So what they had to literally do was they had to know her theory of action, and then they had to be able to make connections with what they saw and heard with what Ai Weiwei was doing in his art and in his own words. So that was the writing assignment. I give them a whole page of possibilities for how to set up and organize their ideas. And I give them different strategies. With each writing assignment, I give them different suggestions so that each time I'm working on different ways that they can organize their ideas and organize the materials. And what I found is when I actually grade these, yes, I will have issues where there are grammar issues, there are syntax issues, there are punctuation issues. And I return all the essays back to them in edit function. And I go through and edit them just like a journal reviewer would edit them. 
and I highlight, I make comments, I explain, and then I meet with students, I triage, and I try to find the ones that really I can identify who really need help and more hands-on time with them. There is no substitute for that. There is no easy way to work with them on writing. And the whole reason I set up my triad this way is to show them that this is a very deep, critical, engaged process that takes time, takes revision. So even my class is set up to give them the sense of this is something I need to spend time on. It needs to evolve slowly. It's this whole critically engaged process. So I triage. I, I figure out the students that need the most help first and then I bring them into my office and I sit down and I begin to work with them and begin to talk with them about writing and we identify their mistakes, find out what's going on. The Writing Center has a tremendous handbook that they use with students that you can pull out and it gives you the little grammar and it explains why this is incorrect and what they need to do to fix it. I don't think there is any way to do that in a way that isn't time consuming and that doesn't take work on our part. It does. And we just like I'm trying to convince them that writing and reading and thinking is this slow evolving process. Um, what we're doing with them in the writing skills is a very long and involved and engaged process. <coughs> Uh, but for me, I have been very pleased with the quality of the work that I have received from students. Um, and I think part of it is getting them to verbalize and to create and draft the sentences out loud and to speak them. And to be speaking in the language and in the concepts and in the ideas. And you can address and correct you know, the errors that you're seeing in their speech although there are always different ones we know when they write because your speaking voice is not always your writing voice. Um, but that's what I'm doing with them. And the whole purpose of the first year seminars, um, and I also have some tremendous materials from Lou Goodman, who also spends a tremendous amount of time with students one-on-one -on -one in his office, reviewing particularly foreign language students uh, for whom English is not their first language, and he spends a tremendous amount of time with those students working with them and by the end of the semester he has had a marked improvement and a decrease in the number of grammatical syntax and punctuation errors in the students work. One thing that I really admire about Lou is his idea of, of this positive pedagogy by conveying to his students that he really cares He's interested in their passions about different subjects in IR. He's interested about who they are and what they are doing and how they're learning. And he conveys that to them in his meetings with them. So he lets them know how vested he is in their success. And so that when, you're, when he engages them in commentary on their essays, he's always prefacing his comments in terms of what he's doing for them in a positive sense and what's good about the writing. And then identifying the spaces and places where the student needs more work and what we need to do together, we as a team, to address these issues. So I will stop there and those were my introductory comments. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much Rose. I'm trying to read my script here but uh, I have loads of notes from Rose's. Uh, great talk on clouding it up, and I have a Catholic reference too. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll be describing uh, six principles that I use to drive my writing for communication course. Uh, I originally planned to do seven, but concise writing is better writing, so now it's six. And six is three plus three. I grew up Catholic, so I guess that's what was probably going on. <laughs> um, before I go on to talk about the first of these principles, one described best by Ernest Hemingway, I'll give a little bit of context for you guys about writing for communication and what it is. It's a required course for all SOC students. So if you're a major or a minor in SOC and anything that SOC teaches, you have to take this course. So each year, um, it has about 25 sections. There's around about 20 students in each class. So hundreds of students go through it each year. It's a very extensive uh, course. And it covers all the major genres of media writing. 
Okay, so you write for print newspapers, for radio, for television, for uh, various forms of online media, Twitter, Facebook, etc. You learn how to write speeches, you write uh, strategic communications such as press releases, advocacy ads, and these kind of things. You learn how to write speeches and there's a little bit of screenwriting also. And we cover the very interesting ways in the digital world that these various genres have kind of melded and merged uh, together. Um, it's largely taught by adjuncts, um, uh, as well as a mixture of full-time faculty and tenured and tenure track faculty. I mean, there's a lot of sections to cover, so we draw uh, from a, a, wide, a wide base. But the crucial thing is that everybody who teaches the class is or has been a media professional. They've been strategic communication professionals, screenwriters, uh, in my case, I'm a former newspaper reporter. So the people who teach the class write a lot, and they kind of pass that on to the students. Now, teaching, uh, I mean, we all write here, and writing is extraordinarily difficult, right? Um, you know, I've been writing professionally for about 17 years, and it's still a struggle most times, and I imagine that's the same uh, for everybody here. So how do you take 20 students over 16 weeks and turn them into kind of clear and competent writers? How do you do that in a way that will enhance their own career prospects? Um, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is, is similarities to what Rose has spoken about, but I've sort of reduced it down to six principles that I come back to over and over again in my own uh, teaching. And the first is going back to Hemingway. Now, I've seen different versions of this uh, quote, so I'm trying to get the exact reference, but he said that prose is architecture, not interior decoration. Okay? So I teach, first and foremost, the architecture. And that means for each genre of media writing, I pr give the students strong scaffolding about if you're writing a print news story, for example, it's the classic inverted pyramid format. All the important information goes up front first, and then everything else arranged in decreasing order of importance. If you're writing a television story, it's a chronology. Or if you're writing a radio story, excuse me, it's a chronology. If you're writing a TV story, the structure is climax, cause, effect. And there are various patterns for writing speeches as well. If you're writing per uh, persuasive writing, there are many uh, classic structures from classical rhetoric about how to do persuasive writing. So it's these formats I work with first, and sort of so the students are plugging their own pieces of communication into those formats. And straight away that gets them thinking about uh, message and audience and clarity, most of all. And I'll come to grammar and syntax in these points later on. But first and foremost, it's the architecture. And I bring this out in exercises. I'll I'll talk about that in a second, but also in assignments. Say, for example, the midterm is it's a take-home midterm. I give them a, a set of information about a news story, and it's, uh, I think it's a made-up news story. It's off an uh, animal rights boat trying to uh, disrupt a seal hunting in Canada, and it's, there's various arrests and things like that. So I give them an extensive set of facts and quotes and different information, and I say, you have to take this information, write it for USA Today, write it for PBS, and write it for CNN. So they're not worried about facts, they're not worried about gathering information, but it's all about structure and presentation to hammer home this architecture idea. So that's how I kind of implement it. Uh, the second point, Rose has covered it extensively, and it's good writing, it starts with good reading. This is the same in journalism and media as well. And I find that the, the providing the class with very good exemplars is a very strong teaching method. Writing for communication takes place in two hours, two blocks of one hour each week. And I structure it in that. The first, up, the, the first hour is talking about the structure, the architecture, but also providing examples. This is a well-written news story. Let's go through it and find out why it and how it works. Okay, and of course, it's a very, it's, it's, the technique is close reading. We talk about sentence structure, transitions, arrangement, all that kind of stuff. And and, and I find that the course goes on, the more students can draw out the techniques inductively, the better. So it's not just me telling them what's happening. And this also, uh, communication students tend to be very, they're very connected to what's happening in what they call the real world, okay? Um, as if this is not real, the table's not real. But uh, they find that if you give a very good example from the New York Times USA Today or something like that, they see that it's not just what's written in a textbook or what I'm saying that this is how professional reporters structure their own work. So they kind of see, well, this is best practice in the field as well. So it's, there's a strong connect between what they see themselves doing and what they're doing in the classroom. And also, they begin to see the connections themselves. So for example, when we cover press release writing, I give them live press releases 
uh, I think the example I use is from Oxfam, the NGO. And I say, read it and pick out the main structural features. And very, very quickly they'll see, oh, actually, it has almost the exact same structure as a print news story. Okay, so the, the, the frameworks are there already, and they're applying them in different contexts. So that works quite well. If we're covering, say, an audio slideshow that you would watch online, they'll see that it's this interesting combination of an, a chronology, as in a radio report, but also in the way TV writing, you write to pictures, which is a very difficult art in itself. So it's this combination of the two genres. Um, and so this good exemplar works extraordinarily well. The third uh, principle, the third idea I use is real-time feedback. I talk about one hour a week is good exemplars and good models and uh, close reading and inductive drawing out of principles. The second hour of the week, I assign an exercise where students will work individually on doing a piece of writing in class. Um, there is a very good book that has been adapted for AU. It has a nice picture of the new McKinney building on the front, writing for uh, mass media. And this is used in all our writing for communication classes. It's particularly strong on exercises and drills and writing drills. So I use many of those and some examples uh, of my own. So I assign those in, in the class session. And I go around and sort of look over students' shoulders as they're writing and offering feedback as they write in real time. I know it's kind of weird. You know when somebody's looking over your shoulder when you're typing, you can't actually type properly. <laughs> but after a, after a couple of weeks, they get used to it. And it's fine. And um, I mean, we all teach, so we all understand how to give feedback and the, the, the correct way and the most constructive way to give feedback. So my feedback is always in the spirit of, you know, perhaps you should work better on this and this will communicate things more clearly. It's never a case of this is really awful and this is really bad. <laughs> of course not. Um, but it's, here's a, a mistake I made early in teaching writing, and not at AU, at another university where I was teaching writing uh, in Ireland. And it was a writing class where I try to fix everything all at once. And it's kind of uh, beginning writers make an awful lot of mistakes. Of course, we all did, I did. Um, but this one guy, I tried to correct everything straight away. And it kind of dented his confidence in a really bad way, kind of moving onwards. And he, he lost, you know, it took an awful lot of effort to build him back up again. Okay, it was a real kind of rookie mistake, but it still gnaws at me a little bit. So now the lesson I've learned is that I always, I give progressive feedback as the semester moves on, but I'll always try and focus on one major thing with each student, with each session. So if it's about syntax, or it's about structure, or it's about arrangement, I'll focus on that only. Even if there are many, many other problems, I'll just focus on that one for that lesson. And if that problem, major problem gets corrected, I'll move on to the next one as, as it moves on. So it won't be perfect, but at least the major problems will be solved. The fourth idea is the idea of audience. And a good way of thinking about writing for communication is to rename it writing for audience. And that enhances the clarity of their student writing when they're not writing just for the professor, they're not writing just for an assignment, but they're writing for a real life audience. So, for example, on the final, it's, it's uh, based around strategic communication writing. And they, each student takes on a role, they're a consultant with a health communication firm who are working uh, for DC to, on a program to encourage uh, women from disadvantaged backgrounds to get breast cancer screening. And so I provide them with the uh, general aims of the organization, what they want to happen, and lots of statistics about rates of breast cancer and health disparities in DC. And so what the students have to do is number one, look at what their aims are and pick out their key messages, their key ideas they want to communicate. And then look at the statistics and figure out who their audience is. And then, this is fairly advanced communication but in a practical setting it works really well, design key messages that resonate with that audience. Very, very difficult uh, communication skill to get right. But they're doing it in a live setting. They have a real audience, they have a real message on a real program. And that, I find, works better than just uh, kind of do this assignment for me. <coughs> it, it kind of enhances the kind of uh, the realism of the project. Uh, and that's better than just a one-size-fits-all kind of approach for writing, I find. So there are the four kind of principles. Prose is architecture, good writing starts with good reading, real-time feedback, and always write for a distinct audience. And the last two are more, a little bit more kind of granular. And uh, somebody mentioned about vagueness 
earlier on and, and the problem of vague kind of writing. Um, and it's this basic writing uh, uh, guideline that you all know it's show don't tell. Show me don't tell me. So journalism writing is a good way to introduce students to this idea because all journalistic writing should be uh, precise and concrete and vivid as much as possible. So say an example I give about a factory closure. Write up this story about a factory closure in a small town. At the start, many students will write something like, a community was plunged into devastation and despair yesterday, da 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 da, da. Okay, that's telling. So we say, no, come on, let's go back and show me. And so eventually, and some students get this right off, they'll say 500 jobs were lost yesterday when a steel mill closed after it went bankrupt. You get that it's devastation, you get that it's despair, but you're, you're showing that, you're showing the despair through the expression of concrete detail. And all beginning journalists make this mistake too, <coughs> even after university. Um, but it's good to kind of instill it early. And journalism writing is a good model for this. Um, because as we all know, a lot of academic writing can be quite conceptual, especially at the, the beginnings of papers and stuff like that. And then the last one, the last uh, piece of advice, and I don't go into great detail about syntax, except one principle. I mean, I started this talk with a prose as architecture, and the last one is a very granular one, and it's the idea that you order words for emphasis in communication writing. And this is a tip that if you apply it, I guarantee you will improve your own prose, um, as well as your students' prose. And it comes from Roy Peter Clark, and it's a very, very good book, Writing to 50 Essential Strategies for Every Writer. He's a journal former journalist, journalism uh, educator now at the Pointer Institute, which is a great organization for teaching journalism and all sorts of writing skills. And his idea of ordering words for emphasis, essentially he breaks down a sentence into three parts. That the, the last part of the sentence should be the most emphatic part. Okay, that's where the main force of the sentence should be. The start of the sentence should be your second most important part, and the middle is your least important information. The example he uses is from Macbeth. Lady Macbeth has uh, apparently killed herself, and Macbeth is told of her death. And I forget who the character is, tells Macbeth. The queen, my lord, is dead. Okay, so dead, is dead is the most important part. The queen, second most important, my lord in the middle. It's not my lord, the queen, dead. And it's not, uh, what's the way of kind of saying it? You can figure it out. The queen, my lord, is dead. Uh, my lord, the queen, is dead. So, you know, you can change it around a little bit. But it sounds the best when you order words. And by applying that principle over and over again, in each and every sentence that they write, it'll improve the clarity and comprehension of their prose. Uh, so they're my six principles. I found them helpful and useful in my teaching uh, and in my own writing. And I'm happy to provide a full syllabus with more exercises in detail if anybody is interested in it. So I'm happy to uh, hear more about that. Thank you. <coughs> So what I like about this, and I think this was a bit, this well, was unintentional, is um, we all come from different disciplines, right? So I'm a lawyer by training and I teach um, law classes in the School of Public Affairs and at the law school, um, but we all have come to some of the same principles and the same practices. So I think, you know, it, it's just, we're, we're getting to the same place. Um, I want to focus on uh, an exercise that we've been trying in our politics, policy, and law scholars program. So the PPL program in the School of Public Affairs is our three-year program. Um, so the students earn a BA in three years. Um, but one of, well, several of the sort of very helpful aspects of it are these. Um, one they go through as a cohort. So in their first year of study, they have a class together um, in the fall and in the spring. The same 20 kids are in the same class in the fall and in the spring. So there's a connection there, right? Um, the second thing is um, the PPL program is designed to be research intensive. Um, and of course, with research intensive comes writing intensive, right? So we're able to have this group of 20 kids who we see repeatedly over the course of the year in more than one class. Um, who also live together as a cohort that we can test out some of these things on, right? So it gives us some unique opportunities to do things you can't normally do in a one semester class. Um, now I'm cognizant that some of you are probably sitting there saying, well, I only have mine for 14 weeks. How could this possibly work, right? Um, 
couple of things. One, I think the university is moving in a direction where we're seeing a lot more of these cohorts. Uh, so we have the, the new scholars program, right, where we have 300 incoming freshmen who are scholars who are going to have this class in the fall and they're going to have a class in the spring. So there's opportunity to do that follow-up. I think with the new <coughs> honors and the major programs that are coming forward um, that are being developed in each of the schools will have those same opportunities. So I'm hoping some of this will translate and pieces can translate even into the traditional 14-week uh, class. Um, so here's what we did. Um, in the fall, the students took Introduction to Law and they took it with me. And what we really tried to focus on was connecting research and writing. Because just as we're talking about how the reading drives the writing, the research drives the writing too, right? Without good research, you cannot have good writing. And I think students so often miss that connection, right? They decide, I have a thesis I want to support. I will now go out and find something to support that thesis, and I will ignore anything that does not support my thesis, right? So I'm sure all of you have written on papers, what about the counter argument? What about this? You know, wh what's the flip side here? Um, so we started with the research, and one of the things that we were able to do is I worked um, very closely with SPA's research librarian. So in crafting the initial writing assignment, she and I sat down and I said, here's the type of skills I want them to get. Let's craft this together. Let's talk about what the resources in the library would be for this research assignment. And then let's bring the students in and actually show them all of these resources. So um, the SPA research librarian is uh, Olivia Ivy, she's lovely. Um, and I'm sure each school has one as well. And um, we, you know, we actually sat down over the course of the summer and I said, here's what I'm thinking, here's what I want to do. And she helped me to craft it with her background in, in, in research. So the first assignment um, that they had to do was a very short one. And I'm actually a huge fan of the two to three page paper rather than the 15 page paper in, in teaching writing. And um, that, that's for a couple of reasons. Um, I would say almost every paper I receive is filled with what I call filler. Right? So the first sentence of every paper says something like, um, this is a really interesting topic because, you know, and I always write, I know that, that's why I assigned it, this tells me nothing, right? Um, so I, yeah, I, I often find myself crossing out the first paragraph of every student's paper and saying, you're not, you're not telling me anything, you just wasted space. If you say to them, you only have two pages and you can't go over two pages, every single word and every single sentence has to count. Right? So I'm a huge fan of these short writing <coughs> assignments. The first assignment they had to do was um, they had to read To Kill Mockingbird, which is fabulous. Um, and then they had to pretend that they were a junior lawyer working for Atticus, the lawyer in the, in the novel. Um, and they had to write a legal memo outlining the defense strategy that they would use um, to defend Tom Robinson, who had been accused of, of rape. Um, and I like this assignment for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it's a non-traditional writing assignment. Right? It's not the traditional academic paper. And two, it's because they're crafting um, different defense strategies, it's a nice way to break down a paper into component parts. Right? So I would say to them, I want three strategies, and you have to get that in two pages. Right? You have to choose your words carefully, and you have to organize carefully. And it forces them to think in a more structured way than I think our incoming freshmen uh, normally do. So we started with discussing this paper in class and talking through principles of criminal law, principles of um, defense theory. And what do you think? And we did this, this talking, right? You know, we discussed it and said, you know, how would you, how would you defend this guy? And they're like, well, I'm not a lawyer. I have no idea. I said, well, just, you know, every law and order show you've ever seen, right? <laughs> what, do you, what do you think of first? And they would say, well, you know, may maybe he, um, maybe it was someone else. And I said, okay, if it's someone else, then where does that take you, right? And, and you press it that way. So we had this initial assignment, um, initial discussion in class. And then I actually devoted a whole class period um, where we went over to the library, sat in the library with Olivia, and she pulled up all the various sources they could possibly use and showed them that there are, um, you know, they are so quick to just go to Wikipedia. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and what she did is she showed them the different databases. So here's where you can find statutes. Here's where you can find case law. Here's where you can find law review articles. And then we talked through what are the keywords you would use? How would you search? Once you get to this point, where do you go next? When do you stop researching? Because some of them just spin out, right? And they can't stop. Or they stop too early. Um, so we had these, we had really explicit discussions tailored to a specific assignment. And I think that's key. 
I think when we talk about research and writing in the abstract, they kind of get it. But when you talk about it in terms of, of a specific assignment that they have to go research together in the library with the research librarian there and then come back and discuss, it, it becomes much more concrete for them um, when it's tied to something specific. So they did that. Um, and then I, um, I set aside <coughs> a week of class time where every single student has to meet with me with a draft. And I say, if you have a paragraph, great. If you have a full draft, great. I'll look at whatever you have. Um, and I try to do sort of essentially what you said, focus on one or two things. You can't fix everything in one session. But you can say, this is not well organized. Let's work on your organization. You know, and you can say things like, this doesn't persuade me. Right? You, you put this out here, but it doesn't persuade me at all. Let's work on your persuasive writing. So I try to focus on one or two things during those sessions. After that, um, we had another week where we did peer review of um, the writing assignments. And this is, this is something I struggle with, because peer review can go very well or horribly wrong, I find. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it's gone horribly wrong. Um, the first time I did it, um, you know, rookie mistake, I said, okay, look at each other's papers, give each other feedback, and they all just sort of sat there looking at each other, right? <laughs> um, so what you have to do is say, look at each other's papers, then go through these six things, right? Look, look for this, look for this, look for this. Um, and I found that was much more, um, much more productive. And there's a sense of, um, at least with these scholars, they wanted to impress each other, so they were more likely to come to class with something to share and actually get feedback on. Um, also, the, the concept of audience. I talked a lot about if you were writing a uh, memo to a senior partner in a law firm, you don't have room to sort of meander and use all that filler, right? That senior partner is very, very busy. You have maybe two minutes of that person's time, again, getting to, to concise writing and, and thinking about audience. Um, what we were lucky enough to be able to do, and then we had a more traditional writing assignment in that class as well, but because these were the scholars, in the second semester, they took um, uh, American Constitution. And in that class, we were able to craft, um, I thought a really interesting assignment that involved writing a case brief and then doing an oral argument, as if they were arguing before the Supreme Court. And this, again, is the connection between the writing and the speaking. Um, and they actually had to work in teams on case briefs. So they had to divide up and write their own individual parts, but then go back and make it cohesive with six different people writing sections, right? And that teaches them another set of skills um, to, to, to bridge those gaps between writing styles. Um, I do think that the oral argument part is so incredibly helpful, because if you have to make an argument out loud, you need to be precise with your language, if you're trying to persuade a judge, right? So we would do a lot of, okay, here's your brief, you have 15 pages. You now have two minutes to persuade a judge. What are the most important points? And that helps them focus on how do I structure my writing? Where do my most important points go? What can I cut? So I think that connection between um, the oral advocacy and the, um, the actual writing is, is critically important. A um, couple of other things to um, note in terms of writing. I When I um, joined the dean's office, I also took on the fortunate role of being the academic integrity officer for the school. Um, so all the plagiarism cases, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, which is um, not the best part of the job, I have to say. Um, but one of the things that I think is important when we're talking about writing is thinking about academic integrity. And when we craft specific assignments with really specific writing outcomes, the instances of plagiarism just go way down. Right, because you can't you can't Google for that paper. Um, when I talked about the case brief that we did in the second semester, we actually made our whole entire case packet, made it up. Right, so it wasn't somewhere else. It was you know. So here's here's the facts of the case. Here's what happened. Here's a piece of evidence. Here's the motion that's going before the court. There's no way to plagiarize with something that specific. So I found time and time again, the more specific your writing assignments are, the less likely you're, you are to run into academic integrity issues. And that's a really nice side benefit, right, when you, when, when you don't have those things happening. Um, so I think, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about writing, the, the more that we can, I, I, I do think we're very fortunate to be able to have these students for more than one semester. So you can really build and do different types of writing assignments. I think connecting the research to the writing is key. I think connecting them um, the research and the writing in specific writing assignments with the research librarian um, is also incredibly helpful. Um, 
And I really think having multiple types of writing assignments, so a traditional paper, a non-traditional paper, a legal memo, a case brief, or whatever your discipline is, teaches them to write for different audiences in different ways, um, and to be thinking about how, how structure would work differently in each of those settings. Um, I think that's enough for now. I think we have lots to talk about. So we'll let people chime in. Sure. Yeah. I have a question for Declan. Yeah. You talked about um, a biblical book called Writing Tools, mm -hmm. and I want to make sure I get the author's correct name. Sure. It's uh, Roy, and then Peter, and then Clark. Roy Peter Clark. Roy Peter Clark. Thank you. Rose, can you triage? Uh, will you send them an email say, I want to talk to you about your paper? Uh, you will you put a note on the paper say you want to meet with them? I send the papers back electronically, so at the end of the paper I will say uh, something, you know, I really enjoyed your writing, you have a lot of really good ideas here, but there are a couple of serious issues we need to address, and then I will say to them, please respond and we'll let's set up a meeting, and generally they respond almost immediately. I tell them, though, I won't be responding <coughs> after 1 a.m., but as, <laughs> as yeah. long as they hit me before I go to bed, and then I'll so set up. respond. Yes, they do. They do. Okay. And I think Lou is really right. It's, if we think about it ourselves in terms of our own careers, writing really puts yourself out there. And it's a, you're in a very vulnerable position when you're writing. And you are, in many ways, exposing yourself. So I try to be conscious of that. And I find that if they really think that, if they really understand, not think in the case, if they really understand that you're here and why you're doing this and why it is important, I <coughs> really have not had, you know, oh, I've had one or two students, but there were other issues that were going on. But the vast majority of the students, in all honesty, they respond right away. And they'll come in and meet with me within the next few days. Thank you. Can we follow up on the question of Lou, as long as you mentioned him? Sure. You said in your presentation that you, and I wrote this down, <laughs> you got certain materials from Lou Goodman. Yes. What type of materials were those, and is that possible for other Oh, yes, he'd those? be more than happy to share those. Mm -hmm. Yes, and he, what he gave me were some direct examples. I had actually asked him to participate with me, um, but he was traveling. Uh, he gave me samples of the way in which he responds to and corrects mistakes on, students pa on student papers. Uh, and he's just had a tremendous success in our first year seminar. Uh, so I would be more than happy to share that. And also he provided a sample of his writing assignment, what it was, and, uh, and then the types of things that he discusses with them in the conversation after that initial assignment, and then the follow-up responses to their writing. And I'd be more than happy to share that. Rose, can I ask about the question of revision? Mm -hmm. um, you said you offer every student the opportunity to rewrite everything that they submit. Of course, that, that's a kind of horrifying thought that you get everything <laughs> And you don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't. <laughs> no, okay. I, I guess I do, but I don't say it. <laughs> but but the, 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 the procedural question is much more, what is the incentive for them? If you write a B paper, and it's marked up, and there are things that it would be better if it were rewritten, what do you promise that student if they rewrite? <laughs> no, this is, this is yes, actually no, a practical yes, question. Yes, Do you average their B out with the A minus they then get? Yes. Or do you then erase the B and give them an A minus? Or, or, or whatever. I mean, I you, average it. You average it? I average it. That, that's yeah. what I've been doing. Yeah. But I could, the, the question of incentive to get them to want to do it again has to have, there's a lot of milk here. Uh, mark up all those mistakes, suggest your syntax could be better. Yeah. Well, the thing for me is they do care when they hit the second and third assignments and they're still getting the same results. Yeah. And then I will say to them, as you may have noticed, I keep all of them in files and I can go back and easily check them and say, as you may have noticed, you're still struggling with the same error and this is really limiting your success in the class. So, you know, I do... This is a big, that's how I approach it. A big problem with foreign students. It seems that we've got two different kinds of, or maybe we have three different kinds of problems, but two at least. 
which is the student that has come up through the American education system with all its faults and virtues and has done certain kinds of writing at the high school level before they get here. And the foreign student that has come out of a very different kind of writing tradition in their own native language and have the problem of, speak, of, of writing in our language. And it getting changing patterns for that second category is very hard because they have been so deeply educated, they, they, they're deeply educated in, 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 in form, but also have, it's not our job to teach English. Uh, and the question that keeps coming, and I'm just gonna get worse, and I think this is a problem as this university becomes more diverse, that's gonna, we're gonna have to scratch our heads about, is what are your, are your writing expectations different for foreign students and American students. And in the American students, you have two different cohorts. One, because we're making a big effort to reach out to first generation people who may have had inferior <coughs> secondary education as well. But just take the foreign, what, what should our expect, writing expectations be for foreign students who are going to have a lot more trouble mastering our linguistic expectations? I, I, I just be interested in what you all think about dealing with the foreign student problem, which are increasingly numerous on this campus and will only get more numerous, it seems to me, as we go down the next decade. If I could just mention that, that's why I would really recommend speaking with Lou. He has really done a phenomenal job uh, precisely on that score, and I think it would probably be worth a good conversation with him. Mm -hmm. I think this is probably worth a panel in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, there is one this afternoon. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, there you but go. But I was thinking yeah. just in the yeah. specific writing context, yeah. there is uh, yeah. a, a different set of problems, or a set of problems. Mm -hmm. right. Um, yeah, so there, I'm, I'm on that panel. So, that's there. <laughs> so, oh, <okay. laughs> um, so but um, you know, and the reason I'm on that panel is not because I have expertise in dealing with international students, but because I've been struggling with the academic integrity issues with international students. Because there's just a different, cons like, uh, many students coming from outside of the U.S. have a different conception of can you own words, can you own ideas. Um, so I'll have international students coming into my office who have very clear plagiarism issues in their paper and it has not occurred to them, right? They, it, and so I've been struggling with that. Um, so that's one of the issues we'll discuss. Um, I think we have to be better university-wide about pointing students to the right resources. Um, the Writing Center you know, has phenomenal resources, as does International Student Services, you know, dedicated directly to international students who are dealing with writing issues, right? So they have expertise that we might not have. So I, I very much try to use those resources um, when possible. Um, walk students over, hand them the email, hand them the phone number, um, and I, I find that does help. Um, also, um, I think it's critical when you can to give a paper very early in the semester. Um, a lot of times we tend to say, oh, you have one paper due at the end, right? And, and there's no time to fix anything. So I have, a, my, you know, my first paper is due like week four, um, and they hate me for it, but I can catch them pretty early mm -hmm. before the midterm mark, you know, you know, I can get that early warning notice out, I can do all of that, catch them early so they have time to improve on that second and that third paper and get them to those resources after the first paper rather than at the end of the semester. Yeah, so early and often. Yeah. If I can present a kind of slightly yeah. more, uh, different uh, spin on that is I found that by providing strong uh, scaffolding in terms of the structures of writing mm -hmm. and strong exemplars, often the students who's first language is not English, end up conforming to those structures a little better because they're not trying to shed previous writing structures. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's a positive benefit uh, for, for these kind of strict, well not, not strict, but clear guidelines on how the information should be presented. And so uh, that's a positive way of looking at it. And the second uh, issue I look at is for students like that who's English conscious might be very, very high. I have intense sessions with them early in the semester as much as possible. <coughs> so their first couple of assignments, I bring them in and basically align editing of their work. And I do it at the start, but I make it clear that I'm not going to be here all throughout the semester to do this, to, you know, to try and empower them to 
work on different sides of the problem. One question I have when you're, uh, you say concentrate, we all seem to be concentrating on one issue at a time, but you're, you're reading through the paper and you're grading it and you see lots of issues. Do you comment on that paper about the issues and then only deal with one issue? What, that's yeah, yeah, I comment on all the errors, but then I give the student, because if you overwhelm them, they're just defeated. Mm -hmm. And so I think you have to say to them, this is, this is the one that's most significant and then these are the next two or however many you want to identify mm -hmm. and let's work on these. So like at the end of the paper, you'll say, okay, these are the most important issues that we need to, to address, come see me. Yep, yep, and then we can you know, like focus on that. I also try to, um, when, I get, when I get a paper and say it's abysmal, right? There's probably one line in there that's not, <laughs> and I try to. I try to. No, I, I'm serious. I try to find that one line and say, yeah. you know, yeah. there there was this really good thought here. What can we do with that? Yeah. Right? How can we expand that? Where does that belong? How do we tease this out? Because you know, I, I see something really interesting here. Let's let's work with that. And I, I think that's a more positive way, especially when if they're really abysmal paper. Yeah. Um, to keep them from getting too discouraged. Yes. So yeah, sometimes it's just reframing our language and how we approach it. Two things. One, um, what you said, um, Jessica, about early in the semester mm -hmm. giving an assignment. Mm -hmm. uh, my first assignment is um, for week three, yep. and they have to compare and contrast a couple of books. Yep. Um, and I find you see what you have. My experience has been they're very uneven mm -hmm. in terms of I have some students with incredible writing skills and then others that you're shocked they're second year grad students. Yep. The other thing I try to do in the, both in the learning outcomes on the syllabus and then I explain to them the first week of class, you know, even though we're here to learn the substance of cultural diplomacy, I feel if I'm teaching juniors and seniors, it's my responsibility this semester to improve your communication skills. And I'm gonna be, um, I was very grateful to the mean editors in my life, and this is part of who I am and how I teach. And I try to give them fair warning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that it really, um, they're not startled yes. when they give that first assignment back. Yes. Yeah. But it's really helpful to see, okay, what do I have here? You know, yeah. so it, it just yeah. wanted to underscore yeah. what you yeah. said and then add that little bit about, I'm, I'm getting a lot more blunt the first week of class <laughs> than I was in my naive yeah. beginning. Right. Yeah. You can always get nicer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing I would add to, I know Betsy Collins has always thought I was a bit insane, but my students are basically, my world politics students write every two weeks. And, and I'm doing the same thing as you, the short and sweet papers, the two to three page papers. Um, and in my FYS, they're writing every two and a half to three weeks. And so they're constantly writing, they're doing in-class writing assignments where, you know, you can, like Declan said, you can kind of go around and move around and see what they're doing. Um, but I think it is important to write early and write often and to just keep doing it. And they've got to understand it's a practice and they just need to keep practicing. So, Russ, how many writing assignments do you make during the semester? Seven. When well, you're teaching a substantive class, yes. When you're teaching writing, okay, yeah. that's part of it. Okay. That's just part of it. I don't think, and, and, and let me preface too, I teach IR theory, and I don't think you can do theory without writing theory. I, you just don't get it unless you can write about it. So, for me, it's also part of the learning of the textual material. And I do all kinds of other creative things with them as well. I have them, uh, sometimes I'll have them actually create uh, little PBS news segments where they work together and they'll create something on one of the things we're doing in class. I'll have them do pictorial essays and write about that so that they can think about the role of visuality. Um, so I try a host of different creative kinds of projects with them, not just traditional straight kind of essay journal writing. I have them maybe do interviews, things like that. Um, I had a student in my identity class that did a phenomenal interview with other students in the class 
on an aspect of identity that she wanted to highlight about African American identity. She set it up exactly like an NPR piece from start to finish. Had someone introduce her as the reporter, she had written all the text for it, she wrote all the text for the other students, and that was a final project, so I tend to give them other opportunities, and I feel I probably have more flexibility right at the undergraduate level to do this kind of creative uh, work with them, um, but it's, it's all of the same stripe. <laughs> I think one of the elephants in the room here is the amount of time this takes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, <laughs> if, if you're on a 2-2 two -two yeah. or a 3-3 three -three course load and you have classes full of 40 students, I mean, the, the amount of time, it, it could never, never end, right? Yeah. Um, one tip um, that has helped me is if I have a, a, a longer paper, right, so if it's, a, if it's an upper level class and they have, you know, a 20 page paper due at the end of the semester, one thing I do um, is have them bring it in in chunks. So, you know, week one, I want to see your first three pages. Or, you know, week four, I want to see that rewritten, or I want to see the next three pages. So I'm not constantly doing 20 pages of someone's paper. And I like that, too, because you catch problems earlier, right? So if their first three pages have these 18 problems, if we can correct them, hopefully their next 17 won't, right? So um, it can be the same writing assignment in smaller chunks, and that helps with the time. And if you give them um, on my, for instance, my essay assignment, this was, <laughs> this is what, you'll see how long it was. There's the reading assignments and then that's the actual essay part, that second half there. So those are all the directions, the grading rubric, the format for it. And I find the clearer I am on the grading rubric and the format, I know what I'm looking for before, you know, and that way I can just move through them very quickly. Um, and that makes it easier for me as well, as well for the students. They know exactly what I'm looking mm -hmm. for. I, I had a, just on that point, I feared the first uh, time I taught writing classes, I didn't give these extensive models and scaffolding mm -hmm. and because that's what you're here to learn, right? I'm just going to give it to you. Um, but I found that uh, by giving it, I wasn't actually giving the game away. It was mm -hmm. kind of yeah. clarifying things for them and it kind of uh, <coughs> the higher quality work produced within the models mm -hmm. than the extreme kind of variance mm -hmm. without the models. No, you're absolutely right. I have a question about oral reports. Mm -hmm. A couple of you, particularly Jessica, mentioned that you have your students yeah. do some of the oral work. And I'm a fairly new teacher, so, <laughs> but my students do a lot of oral reports and my question has to do with public criticism of them mm -hmm. in front of the other students. Naturally, they get up mm -hmm. in front of the class and they're giving their oral report. For my graduate students, or in the last semester of their graduate program, young men particularly, and they're supposed to be practicing giving an oral report to a client. Mm -hmm. They're slouching, they're putting their hands in their pockets, and you know, as a, a mother particularly, you know, I would look down and I would say my scream in my head, young man, stand up and get your hands out of your pockets. But, you know, how do you convey something like that diplomatically in front of the rest of the class so that, you know, it's not uh, so much of a public criticism, but yet you want the other young men waiting to give their turn, you know, a heads up that you're going to mark them down for that. Yep. Um, I agree, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, it, it's not just the slouching, but it, it's the inappropriate dress. Yes. You know, I mean, you yes. know, like the amount of cleavage you Absolutely. see. Yeah, you that's know. right. Um, and you don't, you never want to say that to a young woman in front of other people, right? right. So this yeah. so um, what I tend to do is um, I'll, I'll let students give their oral presentations, and sometimes I break it in in chunks. So I'll have three people do it, and then I'll give some general feedback. And I'll say, these are some things I saw several people do. Let's think about that. And then I give them specific written feedback. So I can say, your, your skirt is too short, right? Or I can say, you know, you, you have this verbal tick that you're doing. So you're not calling people out in front of other people. That's an excellent but, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sort of the general so people can improve and learn from each other and then specific in writing just to them. I imagine, Jacqueline, do you have your folks do practice radio reporting stuff? Uh, we do, but it's, it's the writing. It's not the kind of radio. Oh, um, okay. I mean, writing for communication, if, if you're interested in being a journalist or a radio journalist, you go on to take more advanced classes in radio writing and how to speak on radio. But I do touch on this issue a little in, in speech writing. Mm -hmm. And there are two things to think about. One, I put it in this, I 
recommend putting it in the syllabus. That on your presentation you must address mm -hmm. professionally yeah. da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. you know, because you are presenting to a client. So it's there in, in, in kind of written form. Mm -hmm. The second, um, I talk about in terms of uh, persuasive communication. That when we talk about persuasion and speech writing, I draw on a lot of concepts from classical rhetoric, and one of those is, you know, the, the ethos of the speaker mm -hmm. and how you convey your ethos, and what impression do you give if you're slouching with your hands in your pocket and you're wearing a t-shirt, mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, wearing a jacket and using appropriate gestures mm -hmm. and modulating your voice correctly. Mm -hmm. That's part of your persuasiveness or your lack of persuasion mm -hmm. in how you come across like that. So if they can see that it's, it, that there's no separation between how they look and how they present it that it's all part of the same communicative kind of process. That can, in my experience, has, has advantage. Thank you. Okay. Um, Rose, I was just wondering, uh, you mentioned that you give feedback electronically. Mm -hmm. um, are there, do you see any disadvantages to doing that? Um, no, it's actually faster. <laughs> <laughs> it's much, much faster and you know, I can type faster and give them more feedback, and, and it's not all over the place. One of the things when you handwrite it, you're squeezing stuff into margins, you're drawing arrows, it's a mess, <laughs> and this makes it just so nice in the edit function. <coughs> and there you're highlighting, you can use different colors, you can do all kinds of things, and the students find it very helpful. I have them actually print it out and bring it with them when they meet with me. Mm -hmm. And then we can lay it all out and, and discuss it. But I just find for me and them, it's clearer, neater. Just you just do Word document email? Yep. yep. That's, I just pull it out of Blackboard or actually I have them email me directly mm -hmm. and then I just save it in a Word document, do edit function and send it back. It's really fast. Mm -hmm. And, and I, if, I, if I may add to that, I, I do that also. And I find what's good about it is that <coughs> for writing classes, you end up saying the same kind of thing to many students. <laughs> so you can That's kind of save a little bit of time by <coughs> sort of copying it. Yeah, copying the gist of it. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I rarely grade a paper that doesn't have quite a lot of punctuation mistakes. They don't seem to know the difference between ITS and IT apostrophe S. Now, this is something I learned in middle school, maybe even in elementary school. Um, how do you explain this? Um, I mean, how is it that they can get to American University and make so many grammatical errors? I just don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, the only thing you can do is, you know, just highlight it in red and drop in a little thing and say, here's the difference, I don't want to see this again. You know, I, I, I just don't know what to tell you. We all find it and you just, it, you want to tear, tear your hair out, yeah. but, you know, I always look at it, the buck stops here, so I'm going to try to do it so hopefully somebody else doesn't have and down the road. And check, mm -hmm. yeah. even, you still have this problem. Yeah. I think part of that is because um, they kind of sit down at the computer and there's no editing after. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's necessarily that they don't have the capability to do it. I think yeah. that the kind of lost art of editing is not there. Mm -hmm. So there's no printing it out, reading it through to see if it makes no sense. Yeah. Right, yeah. no proofing, right. basically, yeah. They're doing the spell check, grammar check, but that's not going to catch things like that. Sometimes yeah. they don't even do that. <laughs> well, this, this gets to time management. Yes, right, exactly. Um, and, yeah. and, you know, so I, I try to stress with my students, you are not doing it right if you're turning in what you just wrote an hour ago, right? right. right. You need to write it, <laughs> you need to step away, go do something else. Um, I yeah. also tell them um, to get in the habit of reading their papers out loud to someone yeah. else, yes. yeah. um, because then you yeah. hear mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why when you have these big papers and you, and you do it in chunks, that helps with the time management issue, which also helps with the academic heritage issues. Mm -hmm. um, I yeah. have a um, rule that I wound up for my practicum students, uh, the 80-20 rule. 80% mm -hmm. writing, 20% editing mm -hmm. minimum. And that kind of helps them, mm -hmm. I think, understand your expectation that they're going to go over it before you see it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also show them your own writing. I, I, like, I, will, I will say, look, here's this article I've been working on. Look how much it's changed in the week. And I'll show them how I've marked things up so they see that we're 
none of us are writing perfectly the first time. Um, and it's, it's a continuing process for all of us. There's a, there's a professional dimension as well. There's writing for communication people. Uh, students want to be strategic communication people or spokespeople or journalists. And I say, well, if you're reporting a story and it's full of punctuation errors, your news editor is really not going to have any trust in your reporting ability mm -hmm. if you mm -hmm. cannot punctuate it correctly. Right. So it's actually uh, stunting in a major way your career. It's not that you're not smart, it's that just that you're being a little bit careless. Yeah, I, I think that's a terribly important point that, uh, that I, I try to make. Because you will dis if you distract your reader by any kind of error, mm -hmm. it, me it reflects on the content, because they assume you're careless about writing, you're careless about thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that will, in fact, and, and this goes to the question of, you've got to know who you're writing for, mm -hmm. but when you think about what kind of impression your writing will make, yes. it, the, the writing becomes part of the quality of your thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and getting that across is very hard, I think. Yeah, but it's kind of, ima like imagine if you're writing this strategic communication plan for, I don't know, uh, like a major company, mm -hmm. and you hand them the brief and it's full of errors. Imagine mm -hmm. what that's going to be like. Yeah. 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 Sherry and I were just talking about Sally's question before this, this presentation started. And because I told Sherry that I'm going to start my new semester with a list of my pet peeves mm -hmm. in writing with the it, it and so forth. <laughs> and I'm, that it's going to be my opening remarks. And I'm going to say, if I see any of these, I'm going to write you down. So be very cognizant. And Sherry said she had a list of her own pet peeves. Is it? Yeah, yeah, no, the things that. It's remarkably consistent from semester to semester, exactly, the feedback exactly. on the first mm -hmm. yeah. short paper assignment. Mm -hmm. So I'm hopefully going to get it from her, and maybe Sally and Sherry and I can collaborate on our list of pet peeves, <laughs> and I'd love to see yours as well. They're probably consistent. Many. And that's how I've decided I'm going to open my new semester. Except we'll started. call it editing suggestions. <laughs> Betsy Cohn tells a wonderful story. Once on a, we were on a panel, she told a great story about this very subject. She said she had a brilliant student who very much wanted a particular job, and she was convinced the student was going to get it, and he didn't. And that was because the prospective employer said his cover note had mistakes in it. So I start the semester by telling this story. Yeah. as a, a way of helping them understand, yeah. to, to Tony's point, the, 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 the lack of, prof it hurts your professionalism yeah. if you make these kinds of mistakes. Yeah. It's non-professional. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and that, in fact, they're getting a job. Yeah, and I think that's the whole key point when you're talking about writing with students. You need to connect it, as Declan and Jessica both said, to broader things that are important to them mm -hmm. in terms of bigger life skills, life issues, and where they're going. You know, when I start my class, I always tell them to look around and I say, this is not the group that you are merely competing against. You are competing against concentric circles of ever-widening groups of students and other individuals all over the globe. And you've got to think about yourself in broader context and how well you are preparing for your engagement with the broader world and broader collectivities. And so I'm always trying to make them aware of how competitive the world is and how really meaningful and important it is to pay attention to all these little micro details you know, that you're working on all the time. And I think if you give them a reason and a purpose, I do think they get it. And I think they respond well to those kinds of, you know, real life examples. David Fletcher was telling me one about a student who got his, literally got his dream job, was scheduled to start on Monday, and Facebook, somebody from the office where they were hiring him, went on Facebook, and although students think that that's private and only your in-group is in your Facebook circle, he was notified on Friday afternoon that they no longer intended to hire him. Wow. Mm -hmm. And David Fletcher was telling me that this young man was devastated and so was David. What had the young man done? Just uh, things that, I mean, there was nothing on there that was really scandalous, but there were things, you know, about your groups and what you're doing oh, and, uh -huh. and how you look. There were some photographs of him where he, you know, didn't look quite as professional as he should. 
Um, you Dancing know, on the bar with the drink in your hand. You know, it had to do with hairstyles and body piercings, and you know, there you go. So it just did not have the, I think with um, like OAS or some, I forget the organization, it escapes me right now, but you know, David said he was just devastated. And David tells that story all the time to first year students <laughs> and to juniors and seniors, you know, who are starting on, you know, prospective jobs. Um, so we can teach those lessons with the emails they send us as well. Um, yeah, I'm sure you've all received the hey prof. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is my favorite. Yo Shinko. I get the alliteration, <laughs> but <laughs> to that and the reason I have this question is my one of my department chairs is Arturo Porzkanski and he's very very proper and he does not like his students to call him Arturo and he pushes in, in emails or anything and he pushes back whenever they say that they will start a communication with him either oral or uh, email and he'll stop him right there and he's, he'll say I am um, professor or Dr. Porzkanski I think you can get your point across by uh, so if I get a, hey, Jessica, or hey, right. Prof, exactly. I think you can get your point across by signing it, Professor Waters. Um, and I think they get that. Yeah. I think you can make it a little more subtly. Yeah. I just blatantly said, yo, is not a prof. Well, that's different. Yeah. 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 Salutation. Salutation yeah. for your professors. But yeah. I agree with Jessica. That's exactly what I do. I just sign it. If they use my first name and I'm not comfortable with that, I just sign it Dr. R. E. Shinko, and that kind of gets yeah, the right. <laughs> And I'm, think, I'm thinking of undergrads. Right? Yeah. I think it's yeah. different when you're dealing with PhD candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and you have no, that. No, master's different degree students. I'm not I only okay. teach master's degree students. And, okay. and they, they are. And, and I just think that's the know, but they can try to be very yeah. informal, too. Okay. Mm -hmm. I guess one, just one other thought, and I, I don't know what you're how you would communicate this exactly, but you know, we've been talking about the importance of editing because of the link to their professions and jobs and all this, but what about just the pure love of language <laughs> and the joy of using words in a precise way? How do you, how do you help them with, with the aesthetics of it? Um, I always have them, if you came into my class at the end of the semester, you would find that what my students are doing is they're digging into the text, they're reading out passages, they're responding to the words, they're responding to the ideas, and just hearing the text read aloud from the different writers. And they begin, and I work with them all semester straight away, and it's always a question of read the text, read it out loud, now tell me what you think is important. Why should we pay attention to this? What are the key words? So it's that auditory function of language, which I think in many ways you can get enraptured by the beauty of language itself, by the words and the way the author's putting them together. Um, and then there are just fun things with it, you know, especially postmodern writers. You know, they, they know no punctuation. The senses are, you know, they're just stuffed with words and jargon and lingo. And so that's another fun way for students to play with language on the other side, where language is being used is being used in a resistance way in order to kind of shake things up yes, and to, yeah. yeah, to really um, get on your nerves, if anything else. Um, so there it's an interesting way of playing on the other side of language, um, you know, but I find reading it out loud is, is really helpful. I, I, that's interesting. I was just thinking what it would be like to teach uh, media, writing for communication in postmodernistic kind of terms. <laughs> I hope you don't uh, No, I don't, I don't, I don't. That'd be kind of funny. Uh, I think with, with uh, many communication students have a sort of, uh, they love language anyway, uh, so they're coming into it with that. and. Uh, it's a little mean sometimes, but it's it's uh, for some students it's getting them out of the habit of writing in sort of more florid styles mm -hmm. um, that they kind of learned in high school in English, I think. Um, and I feel bad doing that, but I, I just make it clear that this is the place where you learn a different type of writing. It doesn't mean that the other styles are wrong, but this is a different style, and it's uh, it it is when when you. When it's done really, really well, it can be quite beautiful too. So that goes back to choosing really strong examples. Mm -hmm. um, and the really good examples 
are usually really good in all sorts of ways, including beauty, language, and the arrangement of the material, too. I tell them writing is beautiful agony. You know that that when you're trying and you're, oh, you know, I, when I'm writing, I'm often like making that face, isn't it? Yeah. And I just say it's this beautiful agony because when you get it right, it's just, oh. so, um, and I think some of them believe me, some of them don't. But I'll have some come in sometimes and say, I, I had that moment. I know what you're talking about. And then it's worth it, right? And then there's the thesaurus the, the trap. Yes. Yeah. Looking for yeah. the fanciest word. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which is often the wrong word. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, this goes to the yeah. point of their uh, thought that you will be more impressed if they <laughs> use a long, complicated yeah. word. Yeah. Uh, whereas that often is wrong. Yeah. 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 And, and, and if they don't understand what the word really means, it again has this negative impact on the total. I, in, in, in first class, I you know I thought you know George Orwell's problem about the English language is four rules. And one of them is never use a long word for a short word. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So that becomes part of the framework. For never use a French word or an Anglo-Saxon word. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He says never use foreign words. Either, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I still well, use always use a lot in phrase where. Actually, the trend is toward plain language now. So yeah. 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 Still includes the problem of actually getting them to do the reading. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's still still an issue. That's, so they don't read it. That's a different panel. <laughs> <laughs> that's another panel. Although I've been pretty successful with uh, once the reading becomes more purposeful mm -hmm. and you're holding them individually directly accountable in class for the reading, mm -hmm. um, that sets up the context of the mm -hmm. level of expectations. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Oh. Thank, thank you. you.